What we're going to talk about is the things that Christians can earn up in heaven and the importance of what you should do in your Christian life. Nowadays, a lot of people, we do realize the importance of our salvation, but they don't realize that after salvation, there's a, another important thing that they should be focusing on, and it's their life. So I don't know what you're thinking in your Christian life. So this is going to be kind of like a sermon, too, so this will be good for you. <clears throat> I don't know what you're thinking about in your life, but if I were you, I'd get involved in serving Jesus Christ as a Christian as much as I can. And I encourage you to do that. I know that sometimes you feel fearful, uh, you want to hold back, but the thing is this, is that if you realize that the rapture was tomorrow, if you realized how long heaven is and how short your life is, you'd realize there, there's too many things to do that you've got to do for the Lord. And there's so much uh, to gain up in heaven. You might say, there's too much to lose on this earth. Well, you don't realize that there's even far more that you're going to lose up in heaven. See, what would you lose more, the things of this world or the things of heaven? Amen. All right, so <clears throat> I'm going to, <clears throat> so this will kind of sometime be a reminder, but Christians need to be reminded once more. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 through 11. Paul says, for we must. So we, Paul is including himself a saved Christian. And this is your memory verse you're going to be memorizing. Must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. So, it's very important that in verse 10, you know that you're going to the judgment seat of Christ. You've got to understand that even if you get away with any sin on this earth, which cannot happen, and you feel like that you can do whatever you want in this life, which won't happen, you've got to realize that there is a final judgment called the judgment seat of Christ. Now, when you go to this judgment, notice it says, everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that, he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So you got to realize that in this judgment seat of Christ, whatever thing you've done in this life, okay, are you a saved Christian? That's a simple question. Are you a saved Christian? Then if you are, then you got to worry about this verse. Because in this verse, everything you've done in your life will be openly exposed and judged by God. Every little thing. That's why verse 11, it says, Knowing therefore... The terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, Paul, if he didn't think the judgment seat of Christ is that bad or that important, why did he say persuade men? Why would he say that it's so important to convince you about this? You got to realize this. Paul wouldn't tell you and try to convince you about this if he didn't think it was that terrible, that terrifying. I think we as Christians, our problem is that we're more terrified of the world than we're terrified of God. You, it's, it may be terrifying to uh, surrender everything to God. It may be terrifying to try to serve the Lord. It may be terrifying that what will other people think of me. It may be terrifying that when you're trying to witness to people, you don't want to witness because you're going, well, you know, what will people think of me? Well, I'm going to slip up. You got to realize this. Why, do you ter why are you more terrified of those things than the Lord Jesus Christ? See, what do you think is more terrifying? That's why Paul, he's saying right here, that's the reason why he's trying to persuade men. He wouldn't persuade men unless it wasn't that terrifying. The verse says, the terror of the Lord. Now, you've got to realize that it's very scary when it says terror. Paul said terror. We don't know what the terror is, but that's what just makes it even more terrifying. Because... It's like the dreaded unknown that you don't know about. So I uh, heard a little bit of my brother, you know, when he was giving you a little bit of the announcements. <laughs> when he would mess up in something, my dad would tell him, just you wait, I'll be there. <laughs> and then, just you wait, I'll be there. And then my brother, you know, if my dad says, when I get over there, I'm going to do this and this and this, you know, it won't be as scary. It's scary, but it won't be as scary. But when my dad says, oh, we'll see when I get there, see, your imagination can run wild, and that just makes you feel very, very scared. And you've got to realize that's what God's doing. 
He's saying, we'll see when I get there. And when he gets here and picks us up, we'll see. See, that's why it should be terrifying. I don't know if you're still holding yourself back. Well, pastor, I'm just not ready to witness yet. You know, pastor, I'm not ready to give up everything for Jesus Christ. Pastor, I'm not ready to dedicate myself to attend every single church service. I'm not ready to join you guys in street preaching visitation. You got to realize this now, church, is that this is a judgment seat of Christ. And because I care about you, that's why I'm going to tell you about this. And I got to tell you that what you're doing is not enough, you got to understand. You got to realize there's something more that has to be done in this church. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm actually very content and happy with how much you're progressing. I mean, that's what gives me joy. And a pastor's job is not to beat the sheep. It's to help the sheep, motivate the sheep to serve God. Some of you took years, right? Some of you took years. Amen. So that's the, re that's the pastor's job. But in preaching, because I am preaching at you and teaching you something very important, you've got to realize that this is not something that you should feel like that you can take your time in. You've got to realize, you know what, I've got to make a decision. I've got to serve Jesus Christ. Now, you might say it's very difficult <clears throat> to do these things, and you're right, it is difficult. That's why it's so important to do it now. And when you do it now, you're going to do now little on little things. And what happens is, is that when you do these little things, it's going to grow into bigger things. So if you, don't, if you don't know how to witness and you're terrified, then at least come to street preaching visitation. Just come. You'd be surprised if you come then you're going to observe how they witness. And then naturally, you're going to eventually witness yourself one day. That's what's going to happen. If you're uh, terrified to actually uh, tell a person how to get saved, I mean, that's why we got the tracks. Get the tracks. Start passing them out. But if you won't do these first steps first, then guess what? You're not going to even do more things for God. And then you're going to be unprepared at the judgment seat of Christ, and then you're going to be terrified. See, why, are you more terrified of God or are you more terrified of man? See, we live in a day and age where we're more terrified of man. Now, the thing that Christians think in their minds is that, well, it's so hard, it's so hard, it's so hard. But you've got to realize this, is that, you know, when you look at your entire lifetime of your, all your hard efforts, guess what? Once you hit eternity, you're going to forget everything that you went through. If you pass one million years in heaven, you're going to forget everything that you sacrificed, even the bitter feeling against God. Sometimes you hear me preach this. Anyone who's bitter against God, I challenge you, I challenge you to put, put your finger at God's face and say, I hate you after 100 years in heaven. You can't do that. You know why? Because you're going to be just so much filled with joy up in heaven and God truly paying back and even paying back beyond what you can think of, of everything that you sacrificed. That's why start working. And not only that, when you work hard for Jesus Christ, God gives you grace to go through it. Look at 2 Corinthians 12. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at verse 9. Verse 9. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And we'll read verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. This is what, one of my favorite verses, and it should be one of your favorite verses as well. In verse 9, God says, My grace is sufficient for you. God will give you grace to go through the trial. Have you ever heard of uh, those things called grace periods? Sometimes in your workplace or in business. Or when uh, someone is trying to give you a task to do or take care of you, they would say, be gracious to the person, be gracious to the person. You know what that means? That means, you know, go easy on him. You know, think in his shoes, help him out. And you've got to realize this, God, when he tells you, to surrender all to him and start serving him. You know what's automatically in our mind? We think it's too hard. It's so difficult. But that shouldn't be the case. You got, you'd be surprised when you serve God how much easier it is than you think. 
Now, this is not to say it's so easy that you can be lazy. You will go through some times of testing, trials, and suffering, but you'd su be surprised how much easier it is than you think. And you'd be surprised that there's a task that you thought that you couldn't do, and you actually accomplished. Think about it, some of you, all right? Think about some of you, all right? Before you were able to win a soul, if you were to think back six years ago, do you think the old you would have thought, I would have won this many souls to salvation? Think about the old you six years ago. Would you have thought that, wow, you know, I'd be able to do this much for God. I'd be able to read this much of the Bible. I'd be able to memorize these verses. I'd be able to know all this stuff in the Bible of the doctrines that Pastor Kim and other Bible-believing preachers were teaching. Who would have thought of that, right? Six years ago, would you have thought, man, if that suffering that I'm going through, if I was there six years ago, then I would have given up. I would have fell back. I would have given in easily, right? What about six years ago? The sins that you were struggling with, would you, would you have thought that you would have the victory over them? See, look back six years ago. Six years ago, you would have thought of it as hard, right? Difficult and impossible to do. But see, now, because you already went through it, you realize, you know, God did give me grace to, to go through it. It wasn't as bad as I thought. I'm surprised that I actually did it. I'm surprised I actually accomplished it. You know why? Because God gives you grace to go through it. But some of you who don't believe in this, the easy answer is this. It's because you aren't some of those people who already went through it. See, people who actually believe that God gives you grace to go through it are people who already went through it, not people who haven't even started. If you haven't even touched it or started it yet, that's why you don't believe it. But if you went through it, then you can actually believe it. God, he does give you grace to go through it. I mean, if I were to think back, let's see, uh, 10 years ago, yeah, 10 years ago, after I graduated PBI, that I would have been able to pastor a church where I would sometimes drive for hours while attending school at Berkeley and then trying to get decent grades, above average grades, and then know this much Bible and that all these fruits would come out in the streets and the houses that I knock on, the people who came to my church and people online. You know what I would have thought 10 years ago? There's no way I could have done all that. You know why? Because I didn't go through it. But now that I went through it, I just think it's natural. When these stuff happen, now I just take it naturally like, oh yeah, I was able to do this, I was able to do that. I become a spoiled Christian now. You know why? Because the Lord blessed me too much. And he proved me over and over again. And that's what's going to happen to you. Right now, you've, you feel doubtful, and you wonder if that ever can happen to you, but you can. Look, if God can use a person who, surrender, who started out ever since he was 19 after he graduated Bible Institute and started going for God, if God can use a 19-year-old, don't you think God can use you? Amen. He certainly can. He certainly can use you. That's why it's so important to surrender all. I believe a lot of Christians' problem is they're afraid. Look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. This is why I strongly preach against Lordship Salvation, John MacArthur and Ray Comfort. Because they feel like that you have to surrender all at salvation. Now some of them, they're like changing their minds and they're like saying, oh, we're not saying absolute perfection, you know, but just some sins changed etc etc now they're doing that <laughs> but if you read their commentaries on Matthew 19 they will still teach that subject but anyways I'm not kicking them right now I'm just addressing you Romans chapter 12 verse 1 I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that he present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service so notice that Paul is speaking to who brethren so these are already saved people, but these saved people did not surrender all. It is very important that even though you're a saved Christian, you've got to surrender all. You've got to surrender all and give up and say, Lord, my life is yours. I don't know why some of you will still hold back or not let go. The greatest thing you can ever do in your life is to let go and let God take full control. 
What's holding you back? Is there something that you treasure more in this life? Why treasure those things when they would corrupt and turn to dust? What's holding you back? Because you're scared of what kind of trials and testings you'll go through? Why are you scared of that when you should be more scared of the terror of the Lord? What's holding you back? Because you feel like it's going to be too hard to do and you can't accomplish it? God promised he will give you the grace to go through it. You know, no matter what your excuse is, I don't care what your excuse is, God already gave you the answer in his word. And not only that, I know, I know that you already know the answer too. Because you know it because you heard it from the preaching before. And that's why the best thing you can do is give up all for God. And when you do that, then God can start using you mightily and give you all of himself. You know how God will take care of you? I mean, God is more than good. Do you believe? Let me ask you this. See, that's why faith is so important. If you don't have faith, you're not going to be able to work hard for God. Faith is an absolute necessity in the Christian life. You know why faith is so important? Because that's how we got saved. It was by faith. And now that we got that faith, that faith must grow within our lives. Do you believe God will pay you back beyond your dreams and pay you back satisfactorily for any kind of thing that you fear or what kind of hardship you're going to go through? Do you believe in that? If you strongly believe in that, then you dive to the surrender of the call of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why it's so important to have so much faith in that. Do you believe God will bless you beyond, beyond what you can expect? See, because I believe in it, when I'm going through the pain right now, and then when my flesh c crawls up and I'm tempted to complain, to get discouraged, and to be bitter, you know what prevents me from doing that many times? Is that belief, that strong belief that God will bless me more beyond that what I can imagine, and I'm soon going to forget all of this. He promised me that. Let's look at these verses, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians 3. So let's talk about the eternal rewards, huh? Let's see how God can pay you back beyond what you expect. Let's talk about the eternal rewards. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to read verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest. Right? Your work, everything that you work hard on. God promised it will be manifested. It will be shown. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a what? Reward. But what's your reward? Verse 12. If any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Notice you get gold, silver, precious stones. How many of you would want to get a million dollars in your account? Imagine what you can do with a million dollars. How, how many of you ladies like to buy these uh, nice jewelry so that you can look pretty? How many of you men like to buy those fancy watches and those uh, clips on the ties? How many of you like those kind of refinery, that jewelry? Well, guess what? God's giving you genuine gold, silver, precious stones. See, that's your reward that God will give to you. That's your reward. So that will be yours for eternity. Not only that, let's look at uh, Matthew, uh, Luke, excuse me, the book of Luke. We'll look at chapter 16. <clears throat> chapter 19, excuse me, chapter 19. And you'll notice right here what Christians are offered. Now, how many Americans nowadays are working so hard just so that they can have a nicer house, nicer things in the family, and to be able to go to nice things in the city? Well, guess what? God says the whole city can be yours. The whole thing can be yours. Oh, pastor, you know, you're all by yourself in San Francisco Bay Area. Good, then this nice city of San Francisco Bay Area is going to be mine, all right? <laughs> all the other preachers can stay away, okay? This is my territory. Good, let it be a boss day here. More for me, see? So the thing is this, is that God will give you cities, cities to rule. Look at this verse. 
Verse 12, he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So it's talking about God himself. He's going out. But look over here. We're going to look at verse 16. Then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, little have thou authority over what? Ten cities for one servant. Did you read that? God will give you multiple cities. That's a good deal, right? But look at this. This should be encouraging. All right. Listen to this. Verse 17. And he said unto them, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in what? A very little. Have thou authority over what? Ten cities. Can you imagine that? I think God, he will pay you back more than what you expect, right? Don't you think God's a great God? He'll give you a good deal. When he promised you he will pay back more than what you expect, he really means that. I mean, just a little bit of what you do, he will give you ten cities. Now, this is something you've got to seriously look at yourself. Have you ever thought about why this person will get ten cities? And it makes you wonder. I wonder if there's enough cities for all of us Christians to rule, right? I mean, think about it. If you were to go back to the beginning of Christianity, that's a lot of saved Christians, right? And a lot of saved Christians. So is there enough cities for all these saved Christians to rule on the earth? You know what the answer is? Absolutely yes. Now, you know why the question is, well, that doesn't calculate, that doesn't make sense. You know why? Let me tell you this. Because they're like you. That's why. They're like you. They don't surrender to serve God. Do, can you imagine how many Christians then is going to have an F at the judgment seat of Christ? Do you realize how bad that is? That's why they're going to have many cities to rule. You know why? Because God knows there's still enough room. Because there aren't Christians doing their job. So why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because you're probably one of those Christians, see? That's going to lose all this. You don't want to be that bunch. You want to be the person that, I want to serve God. I got to serve God. Let's also look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 3, excuse me, chapter 3. Now let me ask you this simple question. Doesn't everything of this creation belong to God? Yes or no? Yes. yes, yes, okay. Does Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, and the other planets belong to God? Yes. All right, does this earth belong to God? Yes, okay. Does Las Vegas, does the beautiful sights of San Francisco, the Eiffel Tower of Paris, the Great Wall of China, all that, don't they belong to God? Yes, okay. Your very own breath, does that not belong to God? Yes. Every single person here who's walking and breathing, don't they belong to God's creation? Yes. Look at this now. Verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21. Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Who is this all things? Look at this. Whether Paul, or Apollos, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours. And notice right here, and ye are what? Christ, and Christ is what? God's. If God owns everything, are you a part of God? Are you a part of Jesus Christ? All of this will be yours. Can you imagine that? So that's why the details are not given. Yes, the details are not given on the terror, but the same thing is absolutely true with the details are not given with the joy that he, that of all things are yours. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Don't you think that God will pay you back more than you can expect? Don't you think God will satisfactorily be good to you? So what if, so what if you were tortured for three hours with your, with your tooth, you know? What if you were, you know, what if you lost money, you know? What if your family turns against you, you know? What if uh, you're driving for hours to come to this church? So what that you're so busy in work 
And then you have to stretch time and make yourself come to every single service that you can. Even street preaching and visitation. So what? If all of this is going to be yours anyway. Amen. Look at this. Look at Revelation 22. Look at this. Revelation 22. Revelation 22. Man, that is fascinating. You know, people want to... People just want a few things of this world. And if you're like filthy, filthy rich, then you want to own all the world. But guess what? I'm not just getting a good part of the world or all the world. I'm going to get all of creation itself. They're going to be mine. Now that's something to die for, don't you think? That is even something to die for. Look at Revelation chapter 22. Look at verse 12. Revelation chapter 22. We'll read verse 12. And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is what? With me to give every man according to his work shall be. Don't that make you think that you better get working? Because you know what Jesus said? I'm coming quickly and I'm carrying my rewards with me. Isn't that what he said? That's what he said. Do you know how close we are to the rapture? Ever more than before, you got to understand. You got to realize this, is that that's why if the rapture were to sound right now, God is carrying his reward with him. And you've got to surrender and start working for God right now. When he carries that reward, look at this. Revelation 21 verse 7. Chapter 21 verse 7. He that overcometh shall what? Inherit all things. Now go to Galatians 5. Galatians 5. Galatians chapter 5. Remember... All things are God's, right? And didn't that verse say you will inherit all things? Yes, it did. But guess what? That inheritance is gained by serving Him. Look at that. Look at the inheritance. So the inheritance, I believe the inheritance is all things. That's what it is. That's the inheritance. But do you know how many Christians are going to miss that out? Look at verse 21. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall what? Not inherit the kingdom of God. You know why you should clean up your sins? I know that music is addicting. I know the clothes you want to dress up is nice. I know that the friends you're hanging around with is addicting. I know that you want to keep watching the filth that you're watching on the screen. I know that you want to keep doing the things that you want to do but guess what you do those fleshy things guess what you're gonna lose you're gonna lose all things isn't it amazing we want to keep some things you know we want to keep some things and lose all things can you imagine that why do you want that see that's why it's so important to give up everything for God you know why you don't see it that way I'll tell you why you don't see it that way look at Colossians look at the book of Colossians Look at the book of Colossians. I know you know some of this stuff. But isn't it so amazing that our flesh and mind get in the way that we forget the very basic truths that we should have remembered a long time ago. And we have to tell God over and over again, remind me again. Remind me, dear Lord. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. I'll tell you why. You're still having trouble. It's because you walk in the flesh of what you see. And you don't walk by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 2. <clears throat> Set your affections on what? Things above, not on things on the earth. You know what that verse says? Keep looking up and not down. Do you know how many people just keep looking down all the time? They keep looking down. It's so easy to look down. You know, when your money is running out right now, when you're trying to serve God and people are making fun of you for it, when no one understands what you're going through, it's so easy to give up and give in easily to what you see, right? It's so easy to do that. But you got to keep 
blinding yourself from that and keep looking at what? The things of heaven. You got to keep looking at the gold. You got to keep looking at inheritance of all things. When that person mocks at you, you got to see it as one day that person will bow down to me and serve me. When you lose your house, you got to say this. You got to picture yourself as, oh, I'm going to get a nice big mansion here and own a couple of those uh, buildings. Trump's going to lose that tower over there and then I'm going to get that one. You got to see it that way. When your money is running out more and more because you're giving it to the church for tithing or you're giving it to the missionaries or you're using it, uh, you're losing it because you cut off more time in your work to dedicate yourself to church, you got to see that as I'm getting more gold, more silver on my account. See, that's what you got to do. Anything you go through on this earth, you should, think, you should think the exact opposite of what's going on in heaven. Are you doing that? So when you're doing something sinful, you should automatically switch it to see what's going on in heaven. Oh, there goes my bank account in heaven. It's dropping. When you're uh, looking at something that you shouldn't be looking at on the screen, you got to automatically switch that to the things of heaven. Uh-oh, God's picturing that right in front of me on my face. When you keep being fearful of talking to a person how to get saved right in front of his face, you got to switch that to the things of heaven. Oh, I imagine the face of God right now looking at me. I, I usually say this. You try sinning after seeing Jesus Christ died on the cross right in front of your face. So you try sinning after that. So before you sin, just picture yourself Jesus dying on the cross right in front of, run, right in front of your face. See, that's what we got to do. We got to what? We got to stop going by what we see on this earth, but rather faith on the spiritual side. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and we'll read verse 7. Faith is so important, church. Do you believe strongly? Do you believe strongly? Or do you go by what you feel strongly? Is faith more strong or feeling more strong for you? You are going to go through days where you feel like God abandoned you. You're going to go through days where you don't feel like talking to a soul how to get saved. You're going to go through days where you don't feel like coming to church. You're going to go through days where you feel like, man, it's so hard to serve God. So God is not telling the truth that he's giving me grace to go through. You're going to go through that. But see, you can't go by how you feel. You got to go by faith. You got to go by faith on what God says. Look at 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. And that's got to edge in your brain. You got to edge in your brain every day you walk. Do you know what walking is? Walking is literally every step you take. So think about this. Every step you take to serve God, do you have faith with that? I mean, before you complain, before you get discouraged, before you don't serve God, before you sin, are you doing that in faith? See, when you take every step in faith, it will prevent you from doing a lot of wrong and it will make you do a lot of right. Everything you do, every step you take, do you have faith in that? Do you have faith before you sin that God's going to really beat the fire out of you? When you're terrified to talk to a soul how to get saved and they criticize you, do you believe that God will richly bless you and reward you? Do you... When you are going through a suffering in your time, all right, and you're sacrificing a lot, and work is killing you, uh, you don't have a lot of good things in life, and then you look at all the worldly people, what they're going through, and you get kind of envious, and you say, maybe I should be like them. Before you go through that, do you believe, do you believe that God said he will give you grace to go through all that feeling of pain and sorrow? Do you believe in that? Why people complain? Why people get discouraged? You don't have faith. You don't believe. Faith is such an important aspect in the Christian life that you've got to do. The reason why every generation gets worse and worse and worse is because they don't have faith. Faith is getting worse and worse. You ever wonder why Christian, Christianity is falling apart? Because Christianity is built upon faith. And faith is falling apart. And preachers don't preach and teach the whole counsel of God that builds up their faith. And you've got to have faith. If you don't have faith in God, 
then your life will fall apart. I mean, God forbid, I don't want to say this, but I just want to put you at a situation so you can understand. I mean, what if God took me home and maybe your pastor actually even said something wrong? Maybe, God forbid, I become a Jim Jones cult leader. What are you going to do now after that, huh? Are you going to walk by faith and say, you know what, I didn't, I, I didn't come here for Gene Kim anyways. I came in because I believed what God said in his word. And even though Gene Kim said that, I don't care what he says. I believe what God said. Amen. And I believe that what I did was not a lie. It was a truth. I'm going to walk by faith. See, that's what's very important. And you folks watching online, that's why you got to... See, I'm telling you this because, look, I'm not some cult leader that's trying to get a following. I'm not trying to get you to trust in me. You notice that. I'm trying to get you to trust in God and have faith on what he says. Amen. And you got to believe in that. It is so important in life. People will let you down. I even make mistakes. You know that? I even make mistakes. There are other Bible-believing pastors who have made mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But you know, God never makes mistakes. And that's why, look, if your Bible-believing Christianity is built upon men, where pastor has to keep calling you up, keep praying for you, you have to have brothers and sisters in Christ to keep motivating you to serve God, you are not walking by faith. You keep walking by sight. If you were all alone by yourself, would you still serve God? See, you people online, you don't have a Bible-believing church to go to, I'm sure. But see, that's why you got to walk by faith and not have me or Bible believers here or Bible believing missionaries or pastors out there to be near you. You got to walk by faith and you better pick up, buy, order some tracks, start preaching on the street, knocking on doors, start passing out tracks, tell people how to get saved, try to get involved in the ministry, get to reading your Bible, praying, and study more of that book. Amen. And the same will be said here to the people here in this room. Let's assume church was maybe two hours away, for example, all right? I'm going to give you my case here. In my case, the church that I had to drive to uh, was about Thursday. I had to pick up a group of people. And, you know, people, they don't dedicate themselves to coming to church faithfully anyways. But I'm wasting my time on them. That's what the flesh is saying. And then I have to do good grades in school. And I feel like I could do better in school if I dedicated more time on that rather than on church. But on Thursday, I sacrificed literally, oh. So then with driving, school, yeah, so literally half a day. So I wasted half a day on taking care of that church. I have to leave class immediately, go through all that Santa Monica, LA traffic, go all the way up to Palm Springs and then prepare the teaching and preaching and not only that I'm witnessing street preaching at a hundred degree weather at 5 p.m. once I reach Palm Springs you know what my flesh is saying you know what my flesh is screaming out what are you doing what are you doing I mean think about your school think about your priorities think about this see you know why people don't dedicate themselves to come to every church service you know why people don't dedicate themselves to attend soul winning events I'll tell you why. It's because they don't see it as that important. You see that? I don't know about some of you. <coughs> Excuse me. I hope some of you realized it by now. But did you realize how important it is to attend every event the church has? Amen. You know why? Because it does help you grow, doesn't it? It makes you do more things for God, doesn't it? That's why it's so important to get involved. Would you do that? Would you sacrifice as many hours in your work, your job, money? your priority, your future goals, so that you can prioritize serving God in the ministry? That's what I did. You know that? That's what I did. I prioritized, even though I was going higher and higher in the academic level, I believe in doing my best for God and not being an idiot. I believe you should prioritize money, your future, finances, school, etc. I believe that. You should do that. If you're not doing that, don't blame God, all right? I believe you should do your best. But here's the thing, I never let that prioritize my service for Jesus Christ. And when you do that, see, people prioritize those things more than Jesus Christ. And because of that, that's the reason why you don't see them at, as, in church as much. They used to be the ones to take care of some errands for a pastor, but they don't do it anymore.
They were the ones who used to be the team leader of a certain team at soul winning. They're not doing that anymore. They used to be the ones who would uh, motivate some people at the church and be there where the pastor can count on. But they, they're not there anymore. You know why? And you know what? It's not, I can't, you can't really blame them for that, right? No, we don't blame them for that. But guess what? Between you and God, you will get blamed at the judgment. See, that's what's something very important to understand is that the blame does go between you and God. Me, I'm a very understanding man. You know, I never put the blame on you because I've been through that route too. And God demands me to be understanding of the sheep too. So when people say I have this Aaron or that Aaron, I understand. But here's the thing is that between you and God, only you and God knows if that was a legitimate excuse or not. That's why it's so important before you make an excuse, you got to ask yourself this. Between me and God, am I prioritizing Jesus Christ? And that's an important question you got to ask yourself. Am I prioritizing Jesus Christ or am I prioritizing something else? So it is important that you've got to surrender all to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is probably the most... Um, pointed message maybe I did to you guys to try to get you to do more for Jesus Christ. And I'm glad I actually did talk about this to you. The reason why is this is because you cannot get blessed by God. You cannot have God finally to give you what you beyond your desires. You cannot finally see fruit in your life until you mean serious business with God and your heart is serious. You see, you know how God knows that you're serious with Him? When He deliberately puts a trial in your life and He sees that you're still going to prioritize Him more than the trial. And when He sees you prioritize a trial more than Him, then He, are, then he knows right there that you weren't serious with Him. Some of you are wondering why are the... Maybe some of you are going through trials right now. I don't know what kind of trials you're going through, but some of you are going through it right now. And I notice when people really start serving God well, that's when the trial happens. Do you know why? God is seeing if you were just simply saying that, oh, I will surrender and serve God, or he's going to say, okay, let's see if he really meant that. And when he puts a trial in your path, then he knows you really meant that. You know why God did that with me before I became a pastor? He did that with me before I became a pastor to see, okay, let's see if Gene really meant that. So far, I'm hanging by God's grace. And you will win. You will go through it. There's nothing to fear. Why do you fear when God's grace is on your life? Isn't God's grace greater than all the gates of hell combined? Amen. And do you have faith in that? Yep. Do you have faith God will be fair with you? That God will be good to you? God will shield you from evil? God will give you power and grace to conquer it? And God will also bless you beyond your imagination. Do you believe in that? Yeah. Then you walk upon that faith and you start serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you get, get this time to surrender all to the Lord Jesus Christ, do it by faith. What's holding you back? I'll tell you what's holding you back. You don't have faith. Believe in His power. Hello, this is Pastor Gene Kim of San Jose Bio Baptist Church. Have you ever asked this question that if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you can go to heaven? My friend, it's so simple to get saved. You first got to realize that you can't go to heaven because you've sinned against God. And God, as a holy judge, he has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you feel sorry over your sinful condition. And if you do, there is hope for you. You see, Jesus, who is God, left heaven, came down here on earth, died on the cross, raised himself from the dead. Why did he do all that? So his blood can wash away the sins for you. So you see, that's your only way to heaven, of what he did on the cross, and not what you do in cleaning up all your sins, and going to church, getting baptized, or doing any sort of good work. It's faith alone in what Jesus did on the cross. If you can do that, then all you have to do is say that to God. You might say, well, I don't know how to say it. Can you help me out? Sure, you can say it this way. Dear God, I am sorry for being a sinner. I believe Jesus is God who died and resurrected so his blood can wash away my sins. I trust in that alone and not my good works. 
In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend. If someone were to ask you, how did you get saved? It's very simple, right? What did you do? I just put my faith on what Jesus did on the cross. That's it. My friend, congratulations on your salvation. Right now, because Satan can't damn you to hell, what he's going to try to do now is try to ruin your life. And he did a very good job in this world. That's why it's so hard to find truth, and there are so many lies with a gazillion different churches, different Bibles, different beliefs, different religions. So my friend, it is so important to grow in truth and get involved in a Bible-believing work that can save you from a lot of trouble. There are four things we recommend for you to do, which is found in the resources link below. Number one, get involved in a Bible-believing church near you. Number two, study the King James Bible issue and have only that kind of Bible, no other modern version Bible. Number three, study dispensationalism so you can find the right doctrine and truth. Number four, study only under Bible-believing teachers. My friend, this is all explained further in the resources link below, so please click on it and get to work in a Bible-believing work because you only have one life to live for Him, and you don't want to waste it away by the devil. And I'll be inside that great palace, and the smoke will be so thick, I'll drop to my knees, and I'll drop to my face like those Navy SEALs do, and I'll start crawling, i start crawling, and I'll look down that uh, ivory aisle there, and I'll see a, a throne, and I'll see some feet, that got holes in them, and they got jewel sandals on. And I'll pull myself up to those feet and I'll cry on those feet like that woman that cried on his feet wiped the tears with her hair hey glory to God you're gonna let him do the shining you're gonna say oh God thank you hallelujah and the angels will worship and the cherubim will worship and the seraphim will worship and thank God an independent Baptist will worship Another song said, Once I was straying in sin's dark valley, no hope within could I see. They searched through heaven and found a Savior to save a poor lost soul like me. Woo! Glory to God. He stood out there in my Sodom and he's go, Ho, 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 Jesus saves. <laughs> the Bible says, for God's And he's preaching, and the, and the people that's ringing the bell, there we go. Uh, <laughs> And he'd stand up, and, uh, and people walk up and they said, Wow, Santa Claus preaching. What? Then you enter the throne of glory. Yeah. Oh, oh, the Father opens up his arms, and like there's a banner raised up in the sky yeah. with all the angels. You go to the through Buddha. It's not through the commandments. It's only through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm just going to stay still and I'm just going to study at home. I watch preaching on the TV and you can turn the preacher off. You can turn me off. like your skin turning to gold or something you don't know what's going on here's about two more steps here's that crowd hi how you doing hey mom hi dad hey Steve. hey she does that way down there at the edge of that street there's the lord up there in glory and down he comes off that throne he always would come down for a sitter <laughs> and he comes down there well done now good and faithful servant of the joy of our lord that old boy's heart going down there it says Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Then he laid down on that table, and Dr. Grace got out the scalpel, and he removed that old cold stony heart out of my friend. Oh, he threw it in the trash can, and he put a brand new heart into my friend's chest. And when he woke up, he looked around and he said, Oh, my. 
Everything has been changed. Everything looks different. Oh, I'm so happy now that I had the heart operation. Hey, praise God, there's no other savior like our God.